Okay, in this lecture, our objective is to develop some design equations based on what we've learned so far. Now, these are going to be the design equations that we're going to use again and again and again. So there are some pretty important and pretty fundamental derivations that we're going to go through in this uh, in this lecture, but they're all, I'm pleased to say, relatively straightforward. So let's start off by considering a cross-section with uh, some dimensions, well we haven't actually said what the dimensions are, we'll just deal in symbols for the time being. We've got a strain distribution shown in green to the right and of course we have the now familiar ultimate stress distribution or the stress distribution at the ultimate limit state. So again we're noting that we have the, uh, the ultimate uh, compressive stress 0.567 FCK we have the depth of the compression block, noting that this is the equivalent rectangular stress block. And so the depth of it is 0.8x, uh, where x is the depth of the neutral axis. And we have our force couple, the tension and compression force, and of course separated by that lever arm, z again. All right then. So what we're going to do, actually before we move on, let me just note that this is referred to as a singly reinforced cross section because the main the main uh, reinforcement that's that's resisting uh, longitudinal forces in the section is only in the bottom of the section, or it's only the tensile reinforcement. And um, that's why we call it singly reinforced. Very very shortly, we will go on and look at cross sections that have additional reinforcement provided in the compression block to strengthen that compression block. I don't want to get too into it now. We're going to dig into it in great detail shortly. Uh, but just to draw the distinction between a singly reinforced section, which is what this is, and a doubly reinforced section, which we're going to talk about shortly. Okay, so what we want to do now is uh, we want an expression for the ultimate moment capacity that will ensure a ductile failure. Remember what we said based on the last lecture that we have to ensure a ductile failure, which means we have to ensure the steel fails first. And so that's what we're shooting for first in, uh, in this particular lecture. So let me just write that down. Okay, and again, let me just emphasize that is the key thing here. We have to ensure this ductile failure. So I'm going to define a couple of terms. I, I might have defined these already, but uh, let's just say, let's let M sub E D, that's going to represent the moment induced by external actions or loads. And this is essentially the moment that we're designing for. And we're going to let M or D represent the moment of resistance for a given reinforced concrete section. So let M or D represent the moment of resistance for a given or C, reinforced concrete or C, cross section. And naturally we want M or D to be greater than M E D. All right then, so let's say, let's say again, we've seen this already, right? But M or D is equal to the force in the concrete times the lever arm, which is the same as the force in the steel and tension times the lever arm. All right, now again, we're shooting for, we're looking for, we're looking for the moment that that cross section can develop while ensuring a ductile failure. Okay, so the maximum moment that can be developed for that cross section that will also ensure a ductile failure. Okay, the way we're going to go about this is we're going to say, we're going to say that the force in the concrete Again, essentially we're going to build this expression here. So the force on the concrete, what is it? Well, it's going to be the stress times the area over which that stress acts. So the magnitude of stress that applies across the whole compression block, again, let me come back up here. Let me take that line, uh, let's go with red. Let's take that line, the bottom of the compression block. Let's trace it all the way across to the section. And we're going to identify this area here, right? That area there all experiences the same magnitude of compressive stress and it's not 0.567 FCK. Okay, so what is the what is the force resultant? Well, it's going to be the stress, not 0.567 times FCK times the area over which that stress acts. Right, so the area over which the stress acts is just going to be the shaded, the, the hatched area here, which is going to be B times 0.8x. All right, so we times that by B times 0.8x, and just I'll highlight, that is the stress, that is the area over which that stress acts. So now we want the lever arm, and what's the, what, what's the lever arm going to be? What's an expression for that? Well, if we look at it, if, if the whole depth of that is 0.8x, well then half of the depth is 0.4x, which means that the lever arm here is going to be D minus 0.4x. So that's your Z. So we'll say at the ultimate limit state, the lever arm is going to be 
d minus 0.4 x. Okay, and so we can say that the moment of resistance for our cross section at the ultimate limit state is 0.567. F C K B not point eight X. Let's just bucket all that inside a set of square brackets times the lever arm D minus not point four X. Okay, so what next? Well Remember that we said, or we established a, a limit, <clears throat> a lower limit on the, or a lower limit, I suppose, it's, it's an upper limit on the magnitude of, uh, of x, the depth of the neutral axis. And that was 0.45d. So we said, remember, we limit x, its maximum magnitude can be 0.45d materially or based on the material behavior it happens to be 0.617d our balance section design and um, but of course we limit that or the euro code limits it further back to 0.45d and so we can plug that in for x so that gets plugged in here and here and when we evaluate that expression after we take this and sub it in there and sub it in there we end up with m or d equal to 0.167 f c k times b times d squared so let's put a box around that that's a, that's an important equation to have so another interpreter or not another interpretation another way of writing that you'll often see is m or d equal to k times f c k times b d squared where k is separately defined as 0.167 which leaves the door open to k having different values under different circumstances but we won't uh, we won't deal with that for now so all right then so what's this telling us this is telling us that provided i know the strength of concrete i'm dealing with provided i know the the overall the sort of gross dimensions or the overall dimensions of my section so the width and the effective depth well i can actually work out what is the maximum safe moment resistance for that beam what's the maximum moment of resistance I can design that beam for um, and still have a ductile failure at the ultimate limit state. In other words, at the ultimate limit state, the steel will fail first. So we, interestingly, we don't actually need to know what the area of steel is. We just need to know the strength of concrete and the overall dimensions. Um, and we can determine the, the the maximum safe moment of resistance. Okay, so that's that that's fine. That's good. It's it's helpful to be able to with one quick equation just plugging in a few parameters to be able to work out what M or D is. But actually, for design purposes, I still want to know what is the amount of steel or the area of steel that's required for a given moment. So for a given set of applied loads that generate a a given. Um, uh, design moment med what is the area of steel i would need to provide so that's what we're kind of moving on to now what is the area of steel required for a given set of loading and it's out of the following discussion that uh, the, the, the sort of key this is a helpful equation but the, the sort of key design equations that you're going to use again and again and again are going to emerge from this following discussion so let's say area of steel required and that's going to be a sub s is how we'll denote the area of steel all right so let's let's have a think about this sort of different possibilities here if we have too little steel too little steel uh well then we won't develop the required moment of resistance so if we don't put enough steel in well the steel will yield before we're able to develop the required moment of resistance so that's one possibility okay well what's the uh, what's the alternative or what's the other extreme if we put too much steel in well if there's too much steel if we think about this now we want the steel to fail first for ductile failure but if we put too much steel in uh, well then the steel is going to be able to resist more a lot more load potentially than the concrete compression block and the first thing to fail the weakest link in that chain is going to be the concrete compression block rather than the steel and so if we're if we're not careful and we put too much steel in we're going to force the concrete compression block to fail first leading to a brittle behavior which we can't have and so that's the consequence of putting too much steel in all right so we want to be careful we want it we don't want to just pack in as much steel as possible we want to really be considered in how we determine how much steel so the way we're going to do this is we're going to again we're going to construct an expression for the moment of resistance this is our starting point here for this derivation but this time we're going to consider it in terms of the tensile force okay because it's the it's this tensile force that has the area of steel within it um, so that's going to be ft times the lever arm okay so what is it that's going to be 0.87 times um, FYK. So the 0.87 is just 1 over 1.15, the material factor. So times the characteristic yield strength of the steel. 
So that's the stress, you know, following the same idea as before. That's the uh, stress that is applied uniformly over an area of steel denoted as AS. And of course, we have the lever arm Z as well. Now we could rearrange that to make the area of steel the subject of the equation. So we have AS is equal to M or D over 0.87 FYK times Z. Now, you've got M or D here, which is the moment of resistance. Think, you know, we're, we're actually in the process of deriving some design equations. And so it's just been a little bit pedantic, but I'm just going to rewrite that equation and I'm going to swap out M or D with M E D. Um, because what we're typically going to be doing is we're going to be we're going to be substituting into this equation uh, a value of moment that we're trying to design for, and so again, the, numerically they're going to be the same. But I just want I wanted to say M E D because it just logically makes a little bit more sense in my mind, and it's what you're going to see probably if you go and look this up in a textbook. So let's say the mom, the area of steel is equal to the moment I'm trying to design for divided by 0.87 FYK, which is the design yield stress, times Z. Okay, and so that means I've got to find this Z. This is the kind of the tricky one that I need to work out. So I need to find an equation for Z. Okay, so that's that's going to set us off on our next, because this is... This is actually one of our equations. We're going to come back to this guy, but we got to first work out, before we can use this equation, we've got to work out an equation for Z. So that's where we're going next. So let me just say the lever arm Z at ultimate limit state. That's our next port of call. Okay, so let's start with something that we know. We know M or D, moment of resistance. If we think in terms of the concrete again, it's going to be 0 0.567 fck and we've seen this this isn't new times b times 0.8x so that was the force times the lever arm z okay now i can actually replace that with an equivalent that 0.8x can be replaced with a, an, an equivalent expression which is 2 times d minus z okay it's the exact same thing all right so let's plug that uh, substitute that alternative in and our equation would look like this. And we'll just simplify it down a little bit. Or I guess expand it is probably a better term. And I'm just going to do a little bit of rearranging because what I want to do is, I essentially have a quadratic equation here, but I want to get it in a format that I can solve it relatively easily. So I'm just going to do a little bit of, a, a little bit of rearranging. Nothing more complicated than that happening here. M or D over... 1.134 fck bd squared and that's going to equal z over d minus z over d all to be squared so again let's make a couple of substitutions i'm going to let capital k here equal to m e d over just to simplify what I have to look at here in this equation, FCK times BD squared. And you'll notice that I've done a, another little bit of sleight of hand here. I've just swapped out M or D and I've replaced it with MED. Uh, and so what do I end up with? I end up with a slightly easier to digest equation that looks like this. Z over D. Remember, I'm trying to get an equation for Z. And I have a, what I essentially have here is a quadratic equation in Z. And so I want to find one of the roots of this equation. Um, and that's going to ultimately be my equation for the lever arm. So that's minus Z over D plus that capital K that I've just defined above over 1.134. Let all that equal to zero. And what I essentially have at this point is a simple quadratic and I have to solve for Z. So it's just algebra after this point. So I'll go through it. Um, it's just a little bit of an exercise, as I say, in, uh, in algebra. So the way I, I got to the end here was I started off by just isolating out the Z. So that was 1 over D squared times the Z squared minus 1 over D times z my uh, simple mind wants to wants to look at this equation in the exact same format that i remember it solving quadratic equations in school right so something times z squared minus something times z plus something the something happens to be k over 1.134 
all equal to zero. And now I'm looking at that and I can say to myself, well, I'm just going to use my standard uh, formula for the solution of a quadratic equation. So I'm going to, I'm going to let um, a equal to one over d squared. B is minus one over d and C is k over 1.134. And that all gets subbed into the equation that we all know and love, which is z equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And so we can plug all of the bits and pieces that we've defined over here into that equation. And what do we get? Well, we get z is equal to 1 over d plus or minus the square root of 1 over d squared minus 4 times 1 over d squared times k over 1.134. Square root of all of that and all of that divided by 2 times a, which happens to be 2 over d squared. And with a little bit of uh, further algebraic trickery, we end up with that simplifying down to z equal to d times 0.5 plus the square root of 0.25 minus k over 1.134. Okay, so that is one of the roots of the equation, and that is actually the equation for the lever arm at the ultimate limit state. All right, and that was really all we needed, because at that point, we can kind of summarize where we are and the equations that we have, and you'll see that a path a pathway emerges from knowing what the design moment is, what I'm trying to design for, all the way down to knowing not to knowing what the area of steel required is. So let's just summarize that path here. So I'll say summary of design equations. So we're coming, let's say we come along here and we have a we have a moment that we're trying to design. Let's say we have a beam and we know that beam is subject to some loading. And we can obviously, through basic structural analysis, we can work out that that loading induces a given moment, a given design moment, MED, on the structure. And let's also imagine that we know that the we know what the width of the beam is, and we know what the effective depth of that beam is. We know what kind of height we have or depth we have to work with in this beam. So the first thing we might do is we might come along and we might say to ourselves, well, let's just confirm that the beam overall beam cross section dimensions that we have at our disposal here let's let's confirm that they are capable of resisting the applied moment and so we might calculate m or d i'll give it the additional subscript here max we could go ahead and calculate that as 0.167 fck b d squared so that's the maximum moment our beam is capable of withstanding and still and still delivering a ductile failure. And so we, we might come along and calculate that, and we will find potentially that M or D max is indeed greater than the moments that we're trying to design for. Okay, so then we can move forward. We can say, ah, okay, a singly reinforced beam with steel in the tension zone only, that will work. So I can move on to the next stage of actually calculating what is the area of steel required to resist that moment. Okay, and so the next stage is, Remember, we know what this is based on some structural analysis, MED. So what we do then is we would say, all right, let's work out what K was. So K was MED over BD squared FCK. And that's just going to be a factor. We can take that factor K and we can use it to work out what is the lever arm at the ultimate limit state. And that's equal to, like we just saw, D times 0.5 plus the square root of 0.25 plus k over 1.134. And so when we do that, we're going to work out the lever arm. And once we have the lever arm, we can work out the area of steel required, AS, as being equal to what we started off with at the very start of this, the design moment divided by 0.87 FYK times Z. So K leads to Z and Z leads to AS. And that essentially is a summary of the pathway that you would kind of follow more or less every time. Once you know what the moment is you're trying to design for, you follow these couple of steps and you end up with 
a specified area of steel. And then you would go ahead and as we all see, you would check that area of steel against minimum requirements, maximum requirements, etc., making sure a, a particular arrangement of steel reinforcing bars fits in okay into the beam cross section. There's a whole lot of additional um, administration or housekeeping that needs to be done, but ultimately this is the pathway that leads to a steel reinforcement specification. So we've done about as much derivation um, as I want to do really before we start putting this into practice and looking at a couple of examples. So we'll wrap it up here for this lecture and in the next few lectures we'll come back and we'll just, we'll work through some very, very simple design examples that just basically put these equations to use um, and puts it all into a bit of context for you. Uh, through some examples. All right, so we'll pick it up in the next lecture.